Welcome to Old Economy Village. My name is Sarah Buffington. I'm the curator at Old Economy Village. Um, welcome. Uh, this is the home of the Harmony Society, who lived here from 1824 until the Society closed in 1905. The Harmony Society was established in Harmony, Pennsylvania in February 1805, and they lived there for 10 years and um, decided to move to a better place for trade, for their people, to move away from um, civilization a little bit onto the frontier of Indiana. So they lived there in New Harmony, Indiana for 10 years. But they weren't as well respected there as much as they could be. The people looked at them a little bit differently because they were German. They stayed to their German ways and you know, people looked suspiciously at them. They were a communal society. That meant that everything that they had was held in common. Um, that was a different type of people um, than other people were used to. They were celibate, so they didn't have children. It's a very hard concept for us to understand now. But um, that was something that they believed that they should be because um, they believed that Christ was coming in their lifetime, that the that was eminent and it would happen any time. So they needed to be ready. So they didn't want to be, um, they didn't want to be spending all of their time raising children. So they, they did not have children on purpose. Of course, as the society got older, um, people looked longingly at children and wished that they had children, but, um, but they believed that Christ was coming all the way until the end and um, they lived for 100 years. All in the course of time, they had probably 1,700 people that were harmonists. Um, eight or 900 people came from Germany in the beginning, and, and then they just kept, kept growing. Um, but as time went on, the people were dying off. They didn't have any children to take over, um, and they had to hire people to be um, the workers for their community. Um, they started investing after a while. Um, they had investments in railroad. They had the PNLE Railroad as part of their investment. Um, one of the trustees was um, the president for two years, which is pretty amazing, president of the PNLE Railroad. Um, they also had interest in oil up in Titiute, Pennsylvania. Um, they had several oil derricks there. They also um, did coal. They had coal railroads in Pittsburgh. The Little Sawmill Run Railroad was their railroad. Um, also the Darlington Cannell Coal Railroad was their railroad. Um, they had interests in banking. Um, they had half a million dollars saved at, at one point. Um, and by the end, no one really knows how much they actually did have um, because there wasn't a good accounting of it but they had a lot of things that were locked up in investments. Um, the town of Beaver Falls was actually their town. They had a lot of different um, businesses there, including the um, Beaver Falls Cutlery, the Economy Potteries, and several other places. So that was their town. Um, they also had Chinese workers that came and stayed there for a while uh, working in the, um, in the pottery uh, business. So in the end, um, they, uh, they died off. They had two members left. And they dissolved the society in 1905 and moved to Florida, of course. So I'm going to show you a little bit more about Old Economy Village and um, show you what we have to offer. We're in the Frederick Rapp House. He was the business leader of the Harmony Society. He was very important to George Rapp, who was the leader. Um, because he did a lot of the background work that, that the Harmony Society needed. He adopted, or George Rapp adopted Frederick on the way over from Germany to America. And um, so they, they had a very close relationship. Um, he took care of financial matters. He, um, all of the uh, land was bought in his name um, for the Harmony Society, but he also died in 1834, so it was a, a very um, big blow to the Harmony Society to lose him, such an important figure. Mm -hmm. Frederick had an art gallery on the second floor of this house, 
and um, it's not there anymore. But we do have a lot of the paintings that uh, that he had. Some of them are in some pretty big um, art museums now. But one of the paintings that we have is this one that's um, Christ blessing the children. A lot of their artwork is religious in nature. But this one uh, was done by Franz Flores Fesset. We recently had a restoration in the wrap houses. And we have all this new wallpaper that's uh, reproduced from the originals that used to hang on the walls in this house. So that's pretty neat. A lot of places don't have that. So they found wallpaper in the 1960s during the first restoration um, behind staircases and radiators and things like that. So we have those in our archives and you can see a lot of neat, um, neat patterns from the 1830s in this house. Uh, we also had the carpets reproduced um, from carpeting from that time period. It's not harmonist, but it is um, reproduced from ingrain carpeting of that time period, period, 1830s and 40s. So you'd look at the walls and the floor and the colors in the rooms, and it's just not very matchy-matchy. So this, it's, um, it's typical of 1830s. It's just everything clashes and doesn't match, but that's part of the time period. People weren't really matching colors until later in the 19th century. We are in George Rapp's house. He was the founder and leader of the Harmony Society. This is the dining room for George Rapp and his family. Um, it was used in formal occasions whenever they would have visitors to the Harmony Society. Um, they would go and meet in Frederick's house and then Frederick would bring them over to meet with George. Um, so if you were fortunate enough to come into, um, into the George Rapp house, uh, this is where you would come. So the, the dining room has the Lafayette China to commemorate when the, um, the Rapps and other, some other harmonists went down to Pittsburgh to go and visit um, when Lafayette came to Pittsburgh in 1825 on his triumphal tour of America. We also have um, Bakewell Glass. It's the largest Bakewell Glass collection um, probably in the world. Bakewell Glass was made in Pittsburgh um, and we still have the receipts in the, in the archives for the Bakewell Glass, but it's um, very nice cut glass. Also in this room, there is the stove, the, um, the only original stove that we have for the Harmony Society, and it says Economy Society. So that was probably made by one of the groups of stove makers in the Pittsburgh area. In George Rapp's office, um, the original desk from the church across the street is in this room, and this is the desk that George Rapp uh, delivered his sermons to his congregation. Uh, you can see some of the sermons, some copies of sermons in the old German script. Very hard to read now, but those were um, what he delivered to his congregation with the Bible verses on top and everything. Um, also in the room is uh, the safe um, that was brought here from New York. It was made in New York. It's a very knobby safe, but you have to move certain knobs in order to get into the safe. Uh, so that's really interesting. People are fascinated by that. But that's, that's um, the safe that they would hold all of the, like the money that they would use from day to day. Um, but in order to get into the safe, you have to move certain knobs to find the keyhole. Um, so that's, that's an interesting piece. In George Rapp's bedroom, we have more reproduction of the actual textiles in the room. We also have the hidden um, closet. It was a closet to everyone, but for the um, George Rapp and his housekeeper, they're the only ones that knew about this place. Uh, this is where half a million dollars was stored during the early 19th century. There was a recession in the country, and that was causing all of the country to go into financial ruin pretty much. Well, the Harmony Society had so much money in many different banks and they decided to take all that out and put that in a, in a vaulted area underneath this house. But two people knew where that was. The Harmony Society purchased 
a painting um, in, 18, in the late 1820s. And this was by Bas Otis. This is Christ Healing the Sick. They had this copied from an original by Benjamin West that hangs in the Philadelphia Hospital. So this painting might be a little bit different from that. It's a little smaller. This is a very large painting, but it came over the mountains to this area um, in the late 1820s. Still has the original um, shipping label on the back, which is really neat. They put it together in this room and it's still hanging on the same hooks that it hung on back in the 1820s. So it's been in this house pretty much ever since, just out for conservation. Um, we also have in this room, we have the uh, wax flower arrangements that were made um, by Gertrude Rapp and Paulina Spital, um, probably in the 1870s, but they're in amazing condition for what they are. We still don't know exactly how they made them. We have the wax molds um, that they made them from, but they're just still gorgeous and retaining their color. Uh, we also have the um, French clock. It plays music. It represents agriculture and the Harmony Society believed that you should put agriculture and industry next to each other. So they had matching clocks. We don't know what happened to the industry clock. We have a picture of it. But um, the agriculture clock is still here to, to show what they thought. And that was something that Thomas Jefferson also was looking to represent in this country. And the Harmony Society was a great example of that. We're here with Sandy. Um, that she's going to be demonstrating how the harmonists would have made silk. The Harmony Society um, produced silk as in the 1820s, um, and that was something that was not very much heard of during the 19th century, early 19th century in that time. So um, we're going to have Sandy show you. Okay, this is a silk reeling demonstration. I don't know if any of you have seen. This is a typical cocoon made by a silkworm. It's composed of one continuous filament of silk. And the silkworm wraps himself around uh, in a figure eight with this filament and this cocoon is formed. Along with this, he also produces a glue. It's called saracen, which makes this really tough. Now, in order to get the silk from this cocoon, we have to soak it in really hot water. What that does is it relaxes that glue. And as the glue relaxes, the threads start to loosen. And then it's easier to find the end of that one continuous filament. And yes, you have to find the end. It's tedious, but you can do it. So what I have here, I have a pot of about a dozen cocoons. They've been sitting in hot water for quite some time. And I have the thread from each one of these cocoons drawn through a hook on my reeler. And it's attached to the reeler itself. So let me just loosen this here. So as I turn the handle, the thread is coming from the cocoons and forming one thicker thread. So this thread here is actually about a dozen cocoons worth of thread, but it's still quite thin. You can't really do anything with one filament. It's, it's way too thin. So basically, if you were a harmonist girl and you were assigned to the silk house, this is quite a bit of what you'd be doing. You'd be reeling silk for hours and hours, probably eight hours a day. And this is one of the reasons why silk was and still is sort of expensive today because of all the labor involved in extracting that silk from, from the cocoon. And just to give you some idea of the volumes you needed, one man's silk tie required 300 cocoons, which is quite a bit. And every harmonist woman had a silk dress for Sunday. And this takes yards and yards of fabric. So you can imagine probably tens of thousands of cocoons had to be processed for one woman's dress. So normally, you would have two girls sitting there, and their job was to make sure there was always an end available. So if you started out with 12 cocoons worth of thread, you had to continue to make sure that thread was equal diameter, same diameter. So on the 14th Street, we had two houses, two wooden houses. They were called the cocooneries, and that's where this took place. Uh, the, the silkworm lives off the, the uh, leaves of the white mulberry tree. And so the harmonists had to plant a ton of mulberry leaves here in order to, uh, trees, in order to supply the leaves for the silkworm. So we still have remnants here of the mulberry trees that existed when the harmonists were actually uh, raising silkworms and extracting the silk and making the fabric. By the time 1850 came around, though, they actually decided not to do this because it just was not economical. Believe it or not, even back then, the imports were undercutting them, and they decided that it just wasn't worth it. So they stopped production of silk around the 1850s, but they still continued with their wool, silk, and linen. 
This is an example of some of the silk that they did produce. They, they made silk fabric, they did silk thread for embroidery and millinery purposes, and they also did silk ribbons and edgings. And this is an example, and I'm really uh, proud to say that I own this. This is an example of one of their silk edges. And uh, I'm just amazed, because back then they didn't have chemical dyes, they would have used natural dyes. And the colors here are absolutely beautiful. And if you can see the detail in this flower, it was probably done on what's called a jacquard loom, which is able to do a very fancy uh, weaving. So the Harmonists won uh, lots of blue medals for the quality of their silk. And the woman uh, responsible for this was Gertrude Rapp. She was the granddaughter of the founder of this organization, George Rapp. And she was the one who started the whole silk uh, raising enterprise here at Economy. Uh, smart gal, caught on very well, and she produced you know, beautiful silk for the community. The Baker House is our example of a traditional harmonist house that everyone else lived in. It's very, very different from the wrap houses. Um, it's very plain in here. Um, usually a family of somewhere between five and eight people would live here. Because they lived communally, everything in common, they sometimes um, combined households. So maybe two families might live here. Maybe a smaller family and a larger family would live here. And they also separated men from women because they were celibate. And so uh, the men and the women would sleep on different floors. The Harmonist store was on the main street of town and all the public could come and buy anything that they wanted here. Um, they stocked the store with things from their own uh, manufacture, but they also ordered things to sell in here. Uh, but the Harmonists themselves, the members, did not have to um, buy anything here with money. They did not have money because they lived communally and they just came in and got whatever they needed from the store. The mechanics building was the building where different mechanics would work. Right now we have on display the tailor shop, um, which also has the hat shop in it, uh, the shoe shop, and the print shop. It's believed that the print shop probably was in this building. We're not quite sure. Uh, but this building also is above the wine cellar. The wine cellar was dug by hand um, by the Harmony Society in, um, in the 1820s when they moved here. And all of the dirt that they took out of there is um, in the garden now. It's in the garden creating the vineyard hill. We're in the blacksmith shop at Old Economy with Jim, our blacksmith. Um, this isn't the original blacksmith shop, but um, it's, this was a garage that was turned into a blacksmith shop for demonstrations. All right, so this morning what we'll do, just to give a brief demonstration of how things were back in the early 1800s, I'm going to make you a nail and just show you the amount of work that had to go into one nail um, so they could uh, do the things they needed to do on a daily basis. First thing, we're using the forge and we're using a little bit more modern technology. This is a uh, hand crank blower which would have came in more around the middle 1800s. But it's far more efficient, far better, and I can generate a lot more heat a lot quicker on the metal. And you can see when I want to, and now we have that up to about 1800 degrees. First thing I'm gonna do, I'll hit it and make an offset. And then, basically, I just have to hit on two sides. The anvil will be the uh, third side or the fourth side. It transfers whatever I hit on two sides to the other side. And we just keep hitting this and forming that nail head. Feel that the metal is soft enough. And just like that. And this is a nail header. This is actually what they use to make it with. And you can see we already have our nail pretty well squared away. I'm going to now make a cut right here, heat it up, and I'll cut it. This is what's known as a cutter. The trick to making a nail is actually getting a head 
were enough metal to make the nail head when you're tapping. And I will cut that just enough so it doesn't come off. But on the final part, should be no problem. Stick it here. Break it off. And just like that, we have a nail. And that's how they would have done it one nail at a time back in the early 1800s. We're in the Feast Hall, which was the community building for the Harmony Society. It was built in 1827. Um, this is where they would hold four to six feasts a year um, for all of the congregation. So about eight or nine hundred people could be up in this Feast Hall at one time. Um, you see the doors on either end of the Feast Hall. Um, there's, there's different things that that could be representing. That's for possibly George Rapp addressing his congregation, or it could also be um, just a way for them to store their tables, the feast hall tables that came apart. Um, so we don't know exactly why, but um, those are some of the ideas about why um, those doors might be there. Um, this was the Natural History Museum on the first floor. Uh, this was a museum that was created in the 1820s, the late 1820s. It was 10 cents for admission to come here, so the uh, regular public could come in here. Harmonists didn't have to pay for anything. But um, you'll see in here all sorts of different specimens. We have all these lists in the archives of the different um, specimens that they had. So we've, re we've tried to reproduce that um, here in this museum. We have eagles, um, bear, we have an elk, um, and possibly the elk antlers don't match the body, and they might possibly be from the elk that the harmonists had. They had two elk, and one killed the other. So it's kind of gruesome. They also had a deer park. Um, but also we have an alligator hanging on the wall, and that is something else that shows up in the list of specimens that they had. We also have gems and um, shells and things like that. We have butterflies um, on display. Also, some of their, their books are on display here showing the ornithology um, that, that they were really interested in. Um, also on this floor is Dr. Mueller's office. Dr. Mueller was the head of the museum. He was the curator. He was um, a taxidermist. Um, he he did all sorts of things for the museum, but also he was someone that left the Harmony Society in 1832 with the great schism that happened. Um, one third of the society left during that schism. So he was very close with the Raps, the leaders, but um, they were very upset when he left. Uh, so he went and lived in nearby Bridgewater the classroom here is for the public for um, different programs that we have. But it, the Harmony Society also had um, a classroom, at least one classroom. They were always teaching people. The adults were learning as well as any children that might have been here. They were celibate um, in their community, but they did have some children. So they were always teaching people. They learned things like architectural drawings, um, they learned about birds, they learned um, all sorts of things. Uh, we have a neat little lithograph in this room that is the presidents of the United States. And there's not very many of them here, but that's how it was at the time. We also have a map um, on the wall to show people how things looked in the 1850s. And uh, it's interesting that Lawrence County does not exist on that map. Beaver County um, is, has part of Lawrence County in this map. Uh, the music classroom was a place where the harmonists could 
um, learn and practice their music. Music was a really important part of their life. Um, it was part of their church services, of course, but they also sang um, music in between when they were working. They had um, breaks from their work and all got together and sing while they were having maybe their Vesper brot. Different times they would have a little snack or a meal. They would sing together. So that was part of their community. We have a, a really rich music archives here, so we can hear some of those pieces too. This is George Rapp's garden. Um, he was planning this before he was even planning his house in 1824 when they moved to economy. Um, inside, we have um, all paths leading to the central pond. Um, the pond holds the pavilion and the statue of Harmony. This is a reproduction statue from the 1950s. Um, the original statue does not exist anymore, just in descriptions. But we also have the grotto in the corner of the garden, and that represents the wilderness. So the um, harmonists wanted to move three times. So it was a time, time, and half a time, just like in the revelations in the Bible. So this represented wilder the wilderness, which was their new harmony time. But the grotto shows the, uh, how the harmonists believe that people should be. It's rough on the exterior, but beautiful on the interior. It looks like a Grecian monument on the interior. Also in the garden, there is the, the vineyard hill um, that has all of the grapes growing on it up to a central point. The um, garden itself has an enormous amount of um, biblical references and everything. There's seven paths leading to the central pond that's for representing uh, christening for Christians. But it's just a beautiful place to be. Today, we hold weddings in the garden. It's a beautiful place for weddings. Um, so if you are looking to get married, uh, look into Old Economy Village. Our garden has a lot of historical varieties of flowers and fruits and vegetables, and we raise them in our greenhouse. Um, it's a green, greenhouse that was created in the 1950s, but we did have a greenhouse here in the Harmonist time as well. Thank you for visiting us at Old Economy Village and come and see us in person. We have a lot of festivals to come and see. We have Erntedank Fest in the fall, and um, that's usually in early October. We also have Christmas at the Village uh, in December with a lot to see with the candlelit streets and everything's decorated. We have a lot of vendors to come and see and demonstrators. We also have our garden mart in the spring and many classes and things to see and do. Um, we have a website at www.oldeconomyvillage.org and you can find us on Facebook. So come out and see us. <laughs>